Mexico. <laughs> they don't pronounce the X. Silly, I know, but it's their country. Mexico, 1970. <gasps> Pele, isn't it? Tostao, Jorginho, Gerson, Merson, Rivellino, Thumbelina, Hugh Pugh, Barney McGrew, Cuthbert, Dibble and Grub. Wonderful names, marvellous team. But could any of them have written back home? <laughs> came to the studio and they were great they were just like little boys and at the front was Bobby Moore and Jeff Hurst and Alan Ball who we put to the back because we Alan was too high for us the worst part of that was going on top of the pops with the evening dress you know you felt really out of place I think part of teenagers dancing around you know in obviously what you call casual gear and then 22 come in, dicky bows, and you just felt a pillock, to be honest, you know. And I mean, you've got to remember, this is, this is 1970. Um, people are wearing their hair down to their waist, injecting their eyeballs with acid, and, and making 25-minute guitar solo records, um, and this is regarded as pop music. And along comes this group of footballers. Alf was, was very, very anti, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And I remember going to the famous place, is it Hendon Hall or somewhere, and I went out to see Alf Ramsey. And I'm talking, and they were all shuffling their feet. And Alf Ramsey says, shall we have a number one? I says, you'll have a number one. And he never, ever mentioned it again. It is the first football record to go to number one. I think that, that somehow the song locked into that sense of of separation between the team and the population. They were going across the world to defend the trophy in high altitude and all the rest of it. And so this whole idea of yearning for the folks back home was very, very real. When we first arrived in Mexico, the noise outside with traffic and the, uh, the bands. Everywhere you went, there was a band training, they were there. For the big games, they were there. When we first arrived, it's not just one band, but four or five. We had a right to it, we were world champions. Let's go and take it. That is the goal they needed so much. They were very, very anti, the British. Ray, it looks as if the crowd are going to refuse to give the ball back. It might have been going quicker, and it tended to just move a bit like that. Still in two. And the side of what Reba could do. Reba's got to be a Real, real top class players. It's for the Brazilian side. Weber's going up, so don't remember Wembley. Fuller and Fuller gets the first goal of the game. Fuller gets the first hat trick of the World Cup in Mexico. The Mexicans wanted the Brazilians to win it, there's no doubt about that. And it's a goal! Rivellino. And it's the first goal! Pele. Goal! Where was the goalkeeper? Like Jardino, it must score now. From Brazil. <laughs> Jardino's second goal, and he looked the loneliest man on the field. Yes, everybody's favourite, Brazil. <laughs> Where they play football on the sand, in the sea, even in empty swimming pools, and on tight hairpin bends. Oh, I love a hairpin bend. My mother would throw out her old hair nets. I used to take them and fill them with old newspaper to make a football, which was great. Palais César has added a sartorial dimension to the Brazilian football scene. 
We were young and just played natural football. Open the window. It was just out there. You understand? It made you feel that the world was better in a silly way. The reason why people come back to it and say it's the greatest football tournament ever played is because it was the birth of coloured television. The light in Mexico was just pouring onto these shirts, and particularly the team that played in yellow. They shone in a way no football team had ever shone before. And I don't just mean the way they played, but they physically shone at you. That yellow banana strip, man. Every black kid wanted one, because, you know, colour TV made it look so good on black skin. The, the opportunity. We used to call this shirt the little yellow one. It gave us energy, a positive force. Nine times out of ten, the names on the back of the shirt wasn't actually their name. It was just like, it was like they just said, oh, I want to put a nice name on the back of my shirt just because it looks good, or the letter Z looks really good with the letter H. They're probably all street names, do you know what I mean? I think that's a cool thing. If you can get your street name, carry right over, right over to your celebrity status. Yes. Hey. Say, Spelly. What if he was known by his real name? Enzo. Enzo Arantes de Nascimento. Imagine shouting, hey, and those four names across the pitch. <laughs> no, how do you spell Pele? Pele. G-O-D, God. It says something about the quality of that Brazilian team that everybody remembers Gerson. Rivellino to Gerson. The way he would get the ball and lay it off almost without looking. Oh, yes, Pelé! Pelé was the greatest footballer in the world at the time. Jairzinho scores in every game. Jairzinho is coming deep to get the ball himself. Pelé! The stars, off like the wind, and he's got past him, I think. He's gone. Even then, even then, when you've dealt with all of that, they still has. Rivellino oh, had a marvellous left foot, and he would do this dummy over the ball, and it, it, I've never seen it done so quickly. Oh, that was a bad one, Rivellino. You know, he would he'd put one foot over it and he'd come back. You know, some of the crowd even went one way, you know, instead of the players. He's got a shot like a cannonball, you know. And Rivellino again. And keep on wishing. Left foot, he's got it. Remember the dream. You're too much even when I was a kid, I could hit the ball really hard. Once, during a game in the playground, I took a shot and hit this kid on the side of the head, and he collapsed. All my friends thought I killed him. I was really upset, <laughs> but luckily I'd only knocked him out. Take nothing less. Now it's just out to Rivellino. He's hit the first and scores! World Cup games are really important matches. If you score, it really means something. Scoring a goal was the best thing. Every time I scored, I would just start trembling and swearing and cursing. I couldn't tell you what I said. What can England do on Sunday against these Brazilian attackers? You've got to be impressed by what you've seen from these men from South America. But we were prepared. England's kit was holier than thou. Oh, take it away, Al. We've uh, decided to try our air tech shirts, which seem to uh, give a little more ventilation to the body. These have proved very successful, and also ventilate the shorts as much as we possibly can. I'm not suggesting that these shorts are indecent, but it does give ventilation to the lower part of the body. So England to kick off in this match between the world champion and the former world champion. 
real frying pan atmosphere in the stadium. You need Guadalajara. I use English In Guadalajara, the England players all went out wearing sweatbands, but only on one wrist. Big guys, what's that all about? Excuse me. Bullshit. And England being kept waiting by Brazil. They've been out for nearly two minutes. Waiting for the Brazilian team to come out. England are the only team on the pitch. They're kept there waiting in sweltering heat for five, ten minutes, waiting for the Brazilians to appear. Now it's high overhead. Very, very hot in the stadium. We did that on purpose. If you want to win matches, it's not enough to be well prepared. You've got to use a bit of cunning. Nearly 10 minutes gone, no score. There were few chances in that game, but there was a move that began in my own half. I passed it 50 meters to Jarzino. As he heads the ball, he shouts goal. He says, goal! Kelly! What a save! Gordon Banks! Gordon Banks, for me, the best save I've ever seen. And this is the save of the World Cup! I always remembered Bobby Moore that day. Now, Bobby wasn't quick. But I remember him that day, he was majestic. It was his finest game for England. Costao. And again to Bobby Moore. He didn't just win it. He came out with it and, and had a look where he was going to play it. Giazino. Costao in the middle. Good tackle by Moore. The perfect timing. Fortunately for us, there was one tackle that Bobby Moore didn't manage to make. And Moore beats for one. But back again. Pelly! Gazzino! The whistle has gone, and Brazil will fight one day. And the difference between these two sides was purely in finishing. Moore and Pelé show the respect for each other, but England and Brazil must feel for each other after this match. Oh, Bobby and Pelé, England and Brazil, dear old David Coleman, all brotherly love and peace and harmony. Unless you're watching the other side, of course. There was a feeling that in terms of watching the match, you should watch it on the BBC. ITV decided to steal a march by uh, introducing effectively the football pundit. And the panel became very important to ITV to, to offer something different. Hosted by the enthusiastic Brian Moore, backed up by the quietly dressed Jimmy Hill, in four musketeers who cut and thrust their way to a new level of soccer debate. The unstoppable Derek Dugan, the irrepressible Pat Treran, the ever modest Malcolm Allison, and the youthful Bob McNabb. And how much do you think uh, Alf has advanced in his tactical thinking since 1966? Well, since 1966, since England won the World Cup, I think British football is going back the way, not forward. In those days, if you were on television, you had to be nice and proper and prim and all that sort of thing. We finished up the four of us arguing with each other. And I think it's been proven from with the 1961. Right. When, when it was won the game, this, this is an international level. Every year. Oh, we're cleaning up in Europe. All right then, tactically we're better. You got the impression the public thought then, well, I went to public night with my pals, that's the way we talk. As a team in watching that, we're a complete... But goal. why are we I'm technically better? Play. Why are we technically better than in, in Europe? Better because players. we play against peasant teams who play primitive-wise. Germany and Italy play with a bloody Malcolm, sweeper. Malcolm, we've had Jimmy a lot of letters. You'll get the yellow card in a minute from <laughs> Romanians and Hungarians. No, and I'll tell you what, Jim, I couldn't care less tonight. No, but you must care less about peasants. You don't really mean that. Winding them all up, Malcolm Allison. You're you see, talking about one you, of the top nations in the world. You're I think, talking, I we've think got you, great players you listen, in this country. You, you listen to me, but you don't take what I'm saying. You I'm, would think nothing of uh, blowing smoke in Derek Dugan's face. He waits one or two seconds before he delivers the answer because he thinks about this. What was good about it was that we had never seen football covered in a way which allowed argument. 
and they genuinely argued with each other. We don't have anything but swear. I'm talking about English football. I'm not talking about international football. When you take me literally, I'm not talking about Brazilian Jerry. football. You're talking football. about Perry. Football. I'll tell you something. Football if this manager were manager of Scotland, you would be in the World Cup. I presume they're all drunk. Otherwise, you wouldn't get that much argument. Yes, the the well, number of days, Malcolm, would be there six bottles of champagne, six bottles of German white wine, and I think the bill for the three weeks was about £3,000. Have, have you got the figures for it? Come, Malcolm, you're flamboyant. Listen, listen. Where Alf Ramsey is a complete Doom. introvert, that he keeps his thoughts to himself. Doom. Doom. Whatever he says yeah. to his players, it's entirely his own. Let me tell you, you've got your best tie on tonight, your nice shirt, you look fabulous tonight, you know. You keep stealing all the thunder, baby. Let me no, tell you. <laughs> And the football flowed like champagne. Goals are popping in all over the place. Mm. Valdivia. Valdivia through. That's it. That's a good goal. No doubt about that one. Leandro. Oh, he scores! What oh, a finish cup by Leandro. Riva. And he still gets the shot and makes it! Oh, unbelievable! Sorry, Riva! Meanwhile, at Camp England, all was relaxed and carefree on the day of the crucial quarter-final with Germany. But those endless hands of gin rummy had a devastating side effect, hmm? I was good in the sun. I was good in the sun. I would have to be alive. Alpha, as he always did with Harold Shepperson, you know, count the players, 22 players, and we had 21 players. And Elton, who is it, Harold? And he went, Banksy. And I heard exactly what he said to, to Elf. He said, yeah, he said, Banksy's got Monty Zuma's revenge. He's sitting on the toilet, can't get off. Elf stood up, looked at Peter Vanetti, and he said to me, Peter, you're playing today, all right? And I can remember stuffing something like saying, sure, Alf, that's OK. All ready now for this quarter-final of the 1970 World Cup. West Germany to kick off against England. We were easily the better side in the first 20 minutes, and I picked the ball up on the left-hand side of our box, you know, the ball's played to it, and I played it to Martin Peters, he knocked it back to me, and I just saw Keith Newton making a run, and just smacked it with my left foot, out to Keith Newton, who kept on running, and I decided to sprint as well. And the next thing I know... I had no chance at all, it just flew past it. And then I'd realised that I'd scored this, you know, wonderful goal. And Pullery himself seems to turn round and run up the pitch with his arm in the air, yelling, King Yeah! And Pullery slides the defence like a knife. He went one up, and I can remember making a save and thinking, God, feel good. And good handling by Benetti. Just think how many caps Benetti might have had if Walter Banks had been around. And then at half-time, I was in the dressing rooms, and I remember Harold Shepherdson saying to me, all right, Pete, doing well, enjoying it? I said, yeah, Howard, I'm you know, looking forward to it. And the second half got on, we got 2-0 up. And it's there! We were easily the better side and dominating the game. And Peters came from nowhere, just rushed the ball into the net. He could have made a substitution. Bobby Gold has gone off, and Colin Bell, number 19, is on. Elf decided to substitute Bobby after an hour. And then you realise what an important player Bobby Charlton was to the England setup. Well, Beckenbauer had his hands full with Bobby Charlton. And of course, this released Beckenbauer, who was a national attacking player, to come through. Beckenbauer. Big goal. It hit me right in the, you know, was his first attempt to pass. And, you know, I went down on the floor and it rebounded to him. And then off he went. Beckenbauer. He's brought the ball forward, he's just about on the edge of the area, and he's hit this shot. And I remember going for it and thinking, I'll save this. I couldn't believe it had gone in. It just obviously dipped and gone under me, and uh, ended in that. I could not believe it. I'm just looking on, and uh, I, felt Peter, I felt Peter was nervous. The second goal was a freak. And back about the way, pull up. And right up his toe, finding him to law. It's a fair old scramble. England really now under terrible pressure. Stay there. A goal. What? Go on, go and do that again. Pure luck. A lot of people blame me for the second one. But they said I was in the wrong position. But it's hit the back of his head and just spun up over the air and into the net. 
and people said I was in a ma bad position. Well, what a good header there with Benetti off the line and hopelessly beat. So England really up against it now. They brought a fellow called Grabowski on later on, who was a right winger. Grabowski driving forward. Grabowski crossed it and it went over both our heads. With the winger coming in on Keith very quickly, the ball went right back over my head and of course I didn't have time to get behind Muller again. Manner from heaven, isn't it, for a fellow like Muller? David Coleman, his reaction is 15 seconds of silence. I was down on my knees, I was just so disappointed, you know. And the whistle gone, and West Germany have beaten England and gained revenge for 66. I mean, I could live that game. I could tell you the whole 90 minutes of that game. That game, I couldn't forget about it. If Gordon would have played, we would have won, because Banksy was a big time keeper. He didn't make mistakes. Peter Benetti, from that moment on, I don't think anybody was pre prepared to give him anything like the benefit of the doubt. I probably had the worst game of my life, and, you know, at the lowest ebb of my life from the career point of view. Back home, it was all a rival's lounge, doom and gloom. How do you feel to be back now, sir? I feel great. But in Mejijo, there was still a final to be contested. And I say, Italy and good old Brian Clough have discovered Brazil's weakest link. They've got to be a great side, the Brazilians, because this goalkeeper's dropped more blinking clangers than, than ever can be imaginable. It is an absolute disgrace. And that's a bad second in spot in Kenya. And to keep coming back to cover up for his mistakes, they've got to be a great side. All very canny stuff. Rivellino, and it's Pele! He's got it! Pele has scored! And that is Brazil's 100th goal in the World Cup. Jardinho. Yes. The final goal began deep in our half, where Tostao was helping out the defense. He dispossessed one of the Italian players, and the ball ended up going to Clodaldo, who then, in a fantastic piece of individual skill, dribbled past three or four Italian players using his body swerve. He got to the halfway line and passes to Rivalino on the left touchline. Rivalino took a couple of touches and passed 20 meters to Jarzinho, who was approaching the Italian box. Gave it to Pele, and Pele just knew where I was. He knew that Carlos was on his way, and it was just a case of controlling it and waiting and waiting and waiting and saying, right, here you are, Paul, you can have it now. Pele, and just Carlo Alberto on the right, and it's Paul! Oh, that was sheer delightful football! Pele and I were walking back from the Italian goal, and I said to Pele, only you could make that pass for me to score my one and only goal in the World Cup Finals. Pele hugged and kissed me because we were good friends and we knew we had won the World Cup. And Brazil received the 1970 World Cup. First embraced, then stripped on the pitch by fervent fans in search of souvenir. In the middle, Pele is hoisted high. 